Elena and I bring you warm greetings from our travels the last two months, from your sister churches in San Francisco, New Delhi, New York City, Warsaw, London, Edinburgh, Los Angeles, and just a few days ago, Mexico City. So awesome to be reunited with our family here in Austro China after three years. And isn't it great that we're together tonight, amen? You know, I'm so appreciative, and I know you are too, of uh, two amazing and gallant heroes in the faith, our son and daughter in the faith, Joe and Carrie Wood. I hope you appreciate what you've got. Because I was here February 1st, 2014 at the inaugural. Wow. And everything you see wow. comes from the effort of the Holy Spirit working through them and that awesome mission team. I mean, we're, Elaine and I are so proud of our spiritual grandchildren. Scotty and Jenna and Aaron and Fine going, going to Auckland. Uh, Sean and Tegan coming back here. Now, uh, a special story there. I, I still remember yeah. Tegan coming to the inaugural service. Yeah. And we had a, uh, uh, a dinner on the grounds after the service. Yeah, right. And then after we'd eaten, the brothers and Tegan played rugby. Yeah. But Tegan was out there in her dress, and I'm watching, but wow, she's faster than all the guys. And and then Carrie comes over next to me, she goes, you know, that was me 20 years ago. <laughs> and I'm so proud of our grandchildren, Obed and Bonnie and Emmanuel and Effie. Emmanuel did a spectacular job overseeing the prayer walk today, didn't he? And then there's the Chinese uh, grandchildren, uh, Chi and Themis. Leo and Evelyn, and then James and Lon. Now, now, on Sunday, you're going to see the new GNN. And that segment, The Life of a Disciple, is all about Lon. And when I saw it, I, I, I was moved to tears. Uh, you have an incredible sister in the faith that truly the whole movement is going to be inspired by. And I really love the way that you welcome into the Austral China family, Rico and Janelle. Janelle was on the original LA mission team in 2007. And then of course, now we're starting to have great grandchildren of faith in Juju and Barry. <laughs> And what can I say about uh, Tony and Therese? Uh, they did an amazing marriage class today. And they were there at the very beginning in Portland when there were just 25 people that God used to start the whole movement of God again. And we've been together, believe it or not, almost 20 years. Thank you for being by our side. We love you with all of our hearts. So glad that you're here. Now tonight, you should have, have been given a handout, or at least be able to share a handout with somebody. And the title that's been given to me is The Power of the Holy Spirit. Now you might want to go ahead and start turning over to Zechariah chapter 4. But I want us to get a little background right here in order to fully appreciate the moment as we study the scriptures. I think they were all aware in 1010 BC that David became the king of Judah. Seven years later, he became the king of both Israel and Judah. In 970 BC, Solomon, his son, became king, and in the fourth year of his reign, he began to build the temple of God. And he had unlimited resources for all the plunder that David had gotten from all the nations that he had conquered around Israel. And some have estimated that the worth of that temple 
Some say baptized in gold was worth four billion U.S. dollars. Well, sadly, in 930 B.C., after Solomon died, the kingdom divides into the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah. About 150 years later, in 722 B.C., the northern kingdom Israel is taken to captivity by the Assyrians. This was God showing that he was no longer with them. And then come the early part of the 600 B.C.s, we find that Nebuchadnezzar comes against Jerusalem. And there are three exilings. One is in 606 B.C. The second is in 597 B.C. And the last one is in 586 B.C. where the entire city of Jerusalem, the walls, and the temple itself was completely and utterly destroyed. Again, God underlined, I am no longer with my people. But... A remnant was taken into exile into Babylon. We read in Ezra 1 that the Holy Spirit started to stir in the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. Exactly 70 years after Jeremiah prophesied that something special was going to happen. And he, God puts Paul's heart, sends the Jewish exiles back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple in 536 BC. Two years later, the foundation's laid, and yet persecution comes against it so severe that all building stops for 14 years. And then we read in Ezra 5 that two prophets come to the forefront. Two prophets that start the rebuilding of the temple Haggai and Zechariah. Rabbinic tradition says that Haggai was a slightly older fellow, about 90 years old. And Zechariah was about 18 years old. Wow. Kind of like Emmanuel and me a little bit. Wow. And yet, their preaching spurred on the remnant to begin rebuilding. Wow. What we find from the book of Haggai itself that his last preaching was in 520 B.C., that second year of King Darius. And all commentaries agree that at this point, Haggai dies. Of course, he would have seen the glory of the former temple. Yeah. And so now it's on the shoulders of a young man. And in 519 B.C., according to Zechariah chapter 1, God comes to him in an unprecedented way. In one night... He has eight different visions. Wow. We're going to look at vision number five tonight. And it's in Zechariah chapter four. Now you might want to take your hand out because this is essentially the vision that he saw. A few reminders. First of all, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, oil represents the Holy Spirit. Fire represents the presence of God. Now, let's get in to Zechariah chapter 4, keeping in mind your handout on the side. Then the angel talked to me and returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. Okay, hold on, stop right there. He's in the middle of a vision. Can you imagine being woken up in the middle of a vision? The angel asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels or tubes to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. Okay, you see right here, you see the two olive trees? And of course, a little hint's coming right here. Olive trees produce olive oil, right? Secondly, we see the big bowl right here and the channels or the tubes that connect to the menorah or the lampstand that has cups at the top, seven cups at the top, where there would be a wick, and then, of course, the oil would come, and when it's lit, it would light up. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Now, lampstands all the way through the Bible represent the people of God. And we find here 
that God wanted his people in the Old Testament to be the light of the world. Let's keep reading. I asked the angel to talk to me. What are these, my Lord? He answered, don't you know what they are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So we know that this vision is going to be all about the word of God. As a matter of fact, there's a message to Zerubbabel. Now, who is Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel is the leader of the people of Israel. He's not a king because, of course, Darius was king. And so he's Prince Zerubbabel, but he is in the line of David and later Jesus. Amen? So he says right here, hey, um, this job of building the temple, it's not going to be done by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Verse 7. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you'll become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things since the seven eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now I think most of us are familiar with the term cornerstone. A cornerstone is the first stone that goes into building a building. But the capstone is the very last stone. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's it's that which crowns the architecture wonder. And he says that the hands of Zerubbabel are going to have it, and he will place it on the temple, and everybody's just going to be shouting when it's in his hand, God bless it! God bless it! Verse 11. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches besides the two gold pipes that pour out the golden oil? So you see that on? You see now the two bowls situated by the side of the olive trees and then the pipes that go into the large bowl. He replied, don't you know what these are? <laughs> no, my Lord, I said. And he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Notice it's not the Lord of Israel. It's the Lord of all the earth. Now the questions come, and actually many commentaries are wrong, as to well, who are these two servants? Who are they? Well, of course, we're a people that believe in the word of God. Amen? And we let the Bible interpret itself. Very interestingly, in Revelation chapter 11, we find a very similar vision given to John by Jesus. The only difference is there are two lampstands. Now, it's very plain in Revelation 11 who each of the olive trees are. The first olive tree has the power to turn water to blood and strike the earth with plagues. Who's that? Moses. Moses, the second one. Shut the skies to have no rain. Who's that? Elijah. Elijah. So, figuratively speaking, Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And so what he's saying right here is that the law and the prophets, the word of God, is like the oil that comes into the people of God and ignites them to be the light of all the world. You see, the first lampstand represented the Old Testament people of God. The second lampstand represents the New Testament people of God. Just as in the past, our job as God's people is to be the light of the entire world. Does that fire you want up or not? My first point, wake up. You know, Jesus gave a similar admonition. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Here's the parable called the parable of the ten virgins. Verse 1. 
At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay, stop right there. Almost all the parables talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So these ten virgins are, in our vernacular, baptized disciples. These are not non-Christians. Okay, you with me? Verse 2. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on the way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. He replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. You know, there are going to be some very surprised, quote, baptized people on the day of judgment. Now, to fully understand this parable, we really need to understand Jewish marriage in the time of Jesus. It's actually in three parts. The first is the contract that's arranged between the two fathers of the bride and the groom. And the couple has no say in it. You can ask Raja, that's what they do over in India to this day. The second is the betrothal, or we would call it the engagement. This is the actual marriage ceremony itself. It's only attended, though, by the groom and the bride, the family, maybe a couple close friends. So they give their vow at this point, but there's no sex, and sometimes the betrothal lasted for a year. Why? Well, because in the Jewish mindset, just like in the kingdom, we want people to get to know one another and to be friends when they get married. Amen, guys? Amen. Now, for a lot of people, they're puzzled by some of the scriptures that center around Joseph and Mary. It says that when he found out that Mary was pregnant, he was going to divorce her, though they had not, they were only engaged. Because, you see, they already said their vows, and so he would divorce her, if you're with me right there. Okay. The third part is the wedding feast itself. And the entire community would be invited. It would begin, kind of as the parable is right here, with the groom showing up at the bride's place with the bridesmaids. And then they would all take their lamps and they would go to the streets with their lamps and invite everybody to the wedding feast. After the wedding feast, the best man would take the bride and the groom and then they'd go to the groom's house and the best man would place the bride's hand in the groom's hand and then lead him in the door and shut it. Well, as you can see, this is where the parable really is all about, right? Jesus is the groom, and the church, we are the bridesmaids. Notice the verses 7 and 8. All had lamps, and all trimmed their lamps. So what does it mean to trim a lamp? That's kind of an ancient term. Well, it means, first of all, if there's an existing flame, you blow it out. Secondly, you cut the burnt wick. Thirdly, this is very important, you pour new oil into it, but you got to have oil, right? (laughs) And then you relight it, and it burns brighter than ever before. Now, no, all had lamps, so it looked like they were saved, but not all had oil. What's that teach us? You can be in a fired up church and still not be saved. You got to have your own relationship with God. Are you with me right here? Now we understand the oil represents the spirit and the spirit and the word of God is one. And in my travels, the question comes, how do I, how do I get more faith? 
Turn to Romans chapter 10. And people say, I've lost my dream, or I want to have a dream. How do I get a dream, a kingdom dream? Well, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Wow, so the word of God gives us faith. Isn't that amazing? You know, I still remember as a young Christian, I was just a, a year old, and the Lord, not quite actually, and uh, I was trying to zealously invite all my friends to what we call the soul talk, or like our Bible talks. And uh, it was 10 o'clock on Monday, and one of my fraternity brothers comes on in completely drunk. I'm totally embarrassed. I can't believe this guy's here. <laughs> well, he sat through the whole thing. I mean, he, his clothes were disheveled. His hair was not combed. But after the Bible talk, he came up to the, the, the leader, who was my minister, Chuck. He says, I want to know more about God. And Chuck goes, well, um, you know, you, you might want to read the book of John. Wow. Next week, I forgot to invite him. <laughs> but he shows up early, wow. hair combed and dressed in his right mind. Wow. And, you know, he listens to the Bible talk, and, and afterwards he comes on up to Chuck and myself. And Chuck says, uh, boy, it seems to be a change right here. He says, yes. You know, I was reading the Bible to try to figure God out. Wow. But I saw that God had figured me out. Wow. Two weeks later, Bill was baptized into Christ. Wow. See, that's, that's the power of the Word of God, and you know it. I mean, isn't it amazing? People study for a week or two weeks or three weeks, and they make these incredible transformations. Right. And we're in awe. Where does it come from? The power of the Holy Spirit working through the Word of God. Right. You know, this, uh, this year has been really an incredible one for me. And uh, I actually came into this year with great anticipation. Because in December, I started thinking, you know something? I was baptized at 17 years old as a freshman at the University of Florida on April 11, 1972, at 1.30 in the morning. Now, there are only four people at the baptism, so I don't think they were expecting very much. But I, I came into this year, and I go, you know something? Come April 11th, 2022, I'm going to be 50 years old in the Lord. And I start thinking, I said, man, I've got to do something special. I mean, I, I want to I be as strong as I've ever been spiritually. And so I thought about what I wanted to do. And every year for a few decades, I read through the Bible in the span of about a year. But I thought to myself, if the Word of God gives faith, if I read more Word, if I spend more time in the Word, I'll have a greater faith, and I will, so to speak, burn brighter than ever before. And so I determined that before my spiritual birthday, April 11th, from January 1st to that date, I would read through the entire Bible, and this I did. Wow. Now, it's very interesting. At the time, I didn't really know what was going on. But uh, it's long been my prayer, and I know yours too, that you've always wanted to baptize everybody in your family. Yeah. And I was fortunate to baptize my brother, uh, about a year and a half after I was baptized. I baptized my little sister about 16 years later. But even though my parents came to many things, uh, they weren't baptized. That today is a little bit of a, a sad but happy day because it's exactly five years ago today my father passed away. And so I'm, I'm wearing his tie in honor of him tonight. And, um, you know, time passed, and 
I started thinking, you know, I'm the oldest kid in the family, and now my mom is all alone. I, I've, got to, I've got to really help out mom. So I decided, after my dad died, to call my mom every single day. Now that's quite a challenge, because Elaine and I do a little bit of traveling, and you got to figure out all the time zones and all the things, but to this day, I've never missed a day. And I, I, could, I could sense my relationship with my mom was changing. We were getting closer, and I'd go every four to six weeks to take her to the doctor. But my mom and dad, when I was baptized, didn't believe in Jesus, didn't believe in the Bible. And, um, and even though I wanted them to be interested, even though they came to scores of services to hear me preach, no movement. As a matter of fact, there still wasn't much movement even this year. But the Lord put upon my heart in February. Of course, now I've been reading my Bible now. About 11 chapters a day. That's what it takes to get it done. And so, you know, you're, you're plowing through, you know, Deuteronomy and Joshua. And you're hearing about these incredible victories. And so the Lord put upon my heart, you know what I need to do? I need to give my mom a Bible. Wow. Not just any Bible. I need to find her the coolest Bible I can find. Wow. So I go on the Internet. Now, I wonder to find her a Bible with extra large print. Yes. So I found this beautiful pink Bible. I mean, it's about this thick, by that thick, by this. Yes. And I got her name, you know, it's pink, and I got it printed in uh, silver there. Wow. And I remember in early February, I, I, was, I was very excited to present the Bible to Mom. I go, Mom, I have a present. And she opens it up. She goes, oh, thank you, son. This is, this is so beautiful. That was fine. Elena was there, and we left uh, after dinner, and I came back the next day. And before I could even ask her anything, she goes, son, I could not put the Bible down last night because I could read it without any glasses. I said, well, you know, Mom, you've kept that little booklet on your uh, coffee table there called First Principles. And, you know, I wrote those studies, and the studies are actually dedicated to you and Dad because all the money goes to the McKean Scholarship Foundation. And my heart's beating like this. I said, Mom, how about we go through those studies? She goes, son, that would be a great honor. I go, and so we started studying. As I said, come every four to six weeks. So I do two studies every time. Long story short, May 21st, my 93-year-old mom was baptized into Christ. And only when I began to look back did I understand that the Word of God, the oil of God, had come into me and given me greater faith than ever before. And you know, let's face it, I'm a lot closer to hearing my name called than a lot of you. And though a lot of older people start to lose a little bit, I'm going, hold it, I want to be as fiery as I ever have been when I get my name called. And so my challenge is for your very simple this, wake up and get serious about reading the word of God. I challenge you as we enter next year, the year of miracles, either read through the Bible by the end of next year or by your spiritual birthday. Now, hopefully your spiritual birthday is not next week, but amen. <laughs> Secondly, if you're already doing that, then you need to get serious about studying the Bible using one of the soapy books. Wow. Be it Elena's Elevate, yeah. Raul's First Love, or a very recent one that uh, is really extraordinary. It's, it's by Helen Sullivan. It's called The Change the Faith to Baptize Someone in Your Family wow. in the Year of Miracles. Are you with me here? You know, isn't it, isn't it amazing? We see 
non-Christian change in two weeks, four weeks. And then once we become a Christian, we kind of like plateau out. Why? We're just not into the intense reading of the Bible. We can change as radically and as quickly if we would be but as intent as the days that we studied the Word of God. So also China, wake up. Let the oil of God come in you. And I challenge you individually and collectively, burn brighter than ever before. The second point. The Spirit moves aside mountains. Not by power, not by might, but by my Spirit. And he says, those mountains, those gigantic problems, I'm going to move them aside. I'm going to make level ground. That was the prophecy. You know, it's very interesting. I don't look at the stats too often, actually. But before I come to any conference, I do. And in 2022, the Austro-China World Sector, you started off the year with 167 disciples. In 10 months, in 10 full months, because that's all the stats go up to, you've only had 47 baptisms and 36 followers. You only have two growing churches, CT3 and Sydney. These, these should be sobering. It should be very sobering to you. All the other churches have had negative growth. Yes, there's been COVID. But you know, there are a lot of churches that have grown during COVID. So I see that there are two mountains that we are facing here in Austro China. Number one, the mountain of growth. And number two, the mountain of retention. You know, when you think about it, if there are 167 disciples to begin the year, and you've only had 47 baptisms to date, that means that over two-thirds of us that were disciples on January 1 did not meet anybody yet that's become a Christian. Yes, it's great to be a leader. It's great to jump into studies. But let's just lay it out. If we're calling people to get out there and meet people as leaders, we need to be meeting people. Amen, guys? But over two-thirds of us in here have not met anybody this year. That's gotten baptized. Yeah. What are the issues? Okay. You remember how the church started? Mm. I mean, the Holy Spirit comes down, and 3,000 are baptized in one day. Yeah. Right. Right. Acts 2.41. By Acts 2.47, daily baptisms. By Acts 4, 5,000 men disciples. I mean, the men saw, wow, this is something I can invest into. Yeah. Right. And then we read something very curious in Acts 5. Let's look. At this point, the apostles have been arrested. Why? For preaching the word. And read this, beginning in verse 40. Gamaliel's speech persuaded the Sanhedrin. They called the disciples in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering for the disgrace of the name. Day after day, and in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. In those days, the number of disciples was increasing, and the church said, Amen! You know, in C2-2, three disciples were called in. I'm sad to say that at least one of them 
even denied they were part of the ICC. Wow. You know, it's interesting today, I, I, I have to say, that prayer walk was extraordinary. I, I hope you have it every year. I hope you have it every year. But it's very interesting just to, to be with the people that were praying and to hear these incredible prayers. And yet, when our brothers and sisters got arrested, when they got called in, they got fearful. Now, at the end of the prayer walk, Emmanuel asks, he says, can you close us on out? Our, our theme uh, for this last prayer is protection. And I thought about that. Protection, huh? Well, yeah, uh, God did. I mean, he protected Jesus. Remember his first sermon? Yeah. Right. There in Nazareth? Yeah. He preaches it. And they want to kill him. <laughs> they want to take him to the top of the hill and toss him down. But God says, no, nope, you're protected. Jesus walks through the crowd. Yeah. I mean, right here, all the apostles as a group get arrested for, technically in this passage, the second time. You know, for, for them at this point, they are protected. And yet, we all know, there came a time in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus heard his name called by the Father. And it wasn't that there was no longer protection. It's just that his work was done and he was being called home. The same with these apostles. I mean, they were protected from extraordinary circumstances. But 11 of the 12 apostles die a martyr's death. Yeah. Is that something sad? No, we glory in it. We go, look, these guys died for the cause. You don't die for a lie. Yeah. See, they believed in heaven because heaven is real. Yeah. Yeah. And the Bible says right here that when they got beaten and flung, they're going, I'm so fired up. Yeah. I am fired up to be persecuted for the name of Jesus. Yeah. They were so fired up. What did they do? Now they go out day after day from house to house, never stopping preaching the word. Are you with me here? Yeah. You know, I remember back in 1989, we sent out church planting to Cairo, Egypt. One Egyptian, seven Americans. After eight months, the seven Americans were kicked out of the country. They were arrested and kicked out of the country. I was there. The first eight months there in Cairo, we had 23 baptisms. The one disciple was afraid. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'll come back in four weeks. I'll come back with my wife and my three kids. And we will leave the church this summer. If you're a leader, Come on. you cannot be afraid. That's right. Because God will protect you until your name is called. And yes, we had some death threats that summer. But we had weekly baptisms. I remember going to Moscow when it was still the Soviet Union with a team of 17. One Russian, one guy that thought he knew how to speak Russian, <laughs> and me who had taken six months of Russian. Oh, <clears throat> and this is in the days when, you know, when you land on Tuesday, the first Sunday is the inaugural service. We don't have all this month or two business of trying to get ready. I mean, if you're there, it's church. Yeah. And so we, we landed. Uh, July 9th, 1991. And uh, I still remember going into Red Square with the team. And they, they at first were really excited, but then they started seeing St. Basil's. They saw 
the walls of the Kremlin, Lenin's tomb, the gum shopping center. And instead of being all fired up, they started walking a little closer. And then they saw the Soviet soldiers with the guns. And, and they, they started walking a lot closer together. And I go, wow, we need a prayer. I said, guys, let's go over here on the bridge over the Moscow River. And we started in a circle. And at first, the prayers were very soft. We didn't want to disturb anybody. But then as we went on, as we began to pray, Lord, unleash your spirit in this ungodly nation and let your movement go through all the Soviet territories. We got done. We were ready to preach the word. And next morning, I went off to find a place to meet. Then I sent all the disciples who didn't know Russian to find their Aaron. Uh, you know, an Aaron, figuratively speaking, there, bro. In other words, a guy that spoke Russian and English. I said, you're probably the best place to find that type of guy that's friendly to Americans is down as McDonald's. <laughs> and so they all find their McDonald's. Well, anyway, we preach the word. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I go, oh my gosh, we got service come Sunday. I haven't thought about the singing. So I had the guy that thought he knew how to do Russian translate a few songs, but I knew we were going to have a great crowd. And so I knew it was going to have to be more of a choir than congregational singing. So we got all the errands in there with us trying to help us with the singing. And the first song that we tried to sing was We Shall Overcome. Wow. Now, you got to remember, back in the day, Americans and Russians, they're enemies. Oh and, and so he translated the, the song a little bit off. Instead of We Shall Overcome, we were going to be singing We Shall Beat You Up. Oh. Fortunately, we remedied that before Sunday. <laughs> Sunday came. God bless the 17 disciples with no visiting disciples. With 266 people at church. I remember that we were going to have a baptism that Sunday. And this general comes up to confront me right before church. He says, you will not baptize your, my daughter. I will kill you. I go, let's talk about this a little bit. Well... Era was our first baptism, but she was baptized Friday. Oh, yeah, we had 14 baptisms the first 14 days. Wow. About three months later, there was a hardline coup against Gorbachev. Mm. And they wanted to take it back to kind of a hardline, old-timer Soviet Union. And so what happened? The tanks were in the streets. There was gun shooting. And many denominational groups had gone into Moscow. Well, when they saw the guns shooting and the tanks, I mean, they were out of there. I still remember watching in Los Angeles at my home, one particular group comes back off the plane to California and they stoop down and kiss the ground in California. In the meantime, I'm getting phone calls from the young people's parents. Hey, when is my kid coming back? I'm going, no, they're not coming back. We're, we're committed. Why? Why are you not sending them on back? Everybody else is coming on back. We have converted Russian Christians. And I don't want those Russian Christians thinking that we're going to desert them out of our own comfort and safety. We love God and we love them more than we love our very lives. Ten days later, so many denominational groups had cleared out, and there we were when religious freedom came to the Soviet Union. And that very first year, God gave us 850 baptisms. We cannot, we cannot give in. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Come on. Come on. He's talking to Christians here in verse 8. 
but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Wow. You know, if we have someone that's sexually immoral in our church, we deal with it. We, we are not going to soil God's pure church with that. If we have a liar in our church, we're going to deal with it. Pray they repent, but we're going to deal with it. But you know something? There are two sins in this list that God calls equal to not only immorality and lying, but murder. And that's cowardliness and unbelief. But you know, we rarely confront cowardliness or unbelief. So I don't, no, I don't know if I can convert my family. I don't know if I can get anybody to Bible talk. You know, I think we need to take a long, hard look at this passage and ask ourselves why we've not met someone that's become a disciple this year. Is it unbelief? Or cowardliness? Whichever. You need to repent to God tonight. And you need to be like those apostles. Even, even if they're threatened, you are, you, it's an honor. It's an honor to be arrested and suffer for the name of Jesus. And we need to be going out individually and collectively day by day, preaching the word of God and unleashing the movement throughout all of us of China. Are you with me right here? The second mountain is the mountain of retention. 47 baptisms, 36 fallaways. Does that hit you? You know, it's my conviction that as much joy as a baptism brings, a fall away takes more than that joy away. Because you've invested in that person. It hurts the family. You know, the last 12 months, I've been trying to deal with sections of the movement that just haven't been growing. And I've had to make some very tough decisions. Um, Last fall, I was very concerned about what was then called the Eurasian world sector. It hadn't grown for three years. And so, I talked to Elena, and she wasn't too big on it, but I said, babe, I'm going to have to go on over to Kiev. And I'm going to spend about five weeks over there, and i got to rebuild a sold-out base of disciples. Because we all know that a sold-out base of disciples baptizes, right? A sold-out base of disciples multiplies, right? Up to this point, they supposedly had 86 people on the roll, and they had only 11 baptisms, and they had 10 people on staff. I arrive after one week of getting with disciples, I survey the church, I start first principles, and I find there's only 68 disciples. I got four weeks left. I organize them into family groups, Bible talks. And I continue to preach the first principles. But then, second week, I had created this uh, Bible talk leaders chat. And so one morning, I just simply put a selfie of me early in the morning on the chat. And I had a few comments like, ha, ha, ha. (laughs) Next morning, I put another selfie of me. It was dark. There was a monument behind me. Took a selfie and put it, I put it again. A few more, oh, bro, that's a very famous monument. I come to staff. I go, guys. Do you know why I'm taking selfies early in the morning? I hate my picture. I know it was dark. That was a comfort to me. But but let's look at Mark 135. It says that Jesus got up while it was still dark, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. I got to get you guys. 
to be sold out with God. You need to be getting up before it's light, just like Jesus, and having that time with God. Well, the next morning, a few others caught onto it, a few more selfie shots. I was going, good, it's starting to catch. A couple of staff days later, I say, hey guys, not everybody's got their selfie on this thing yet. Eventually, everybody gets it, amen. Almost the last week, I said, okay, now what you have to do in your Bible talk chats, you've got to post your selfie while it's still dark. Don't say anything. Just post it while it's still dark. Of course, the same thing happened to them. But bottom line, then they called every single member of their Bible talk to get up while it was still dark and have that time with God. Well, granted, it's, you know, those 68 disciples, they were hurting, but after first principles, the overview of the book of Acts, in the four weeks I had, we had three baptisms and a restoration. I had to leave for the European Missions Conference right afterwards. I didn't really know if I'd affected the sold-out base. Well, I brought the Antelons with me in the middle of January, the Causes, and I still remember the very first hymn. I mean, that key of church just sang out, boom! I mean, it was so loud, I go, wow! See, you can always tell the heart of a church by its singing. Uh, and Tony comes up abroad, I've never heard singing like this, John. Bro, this is incredible. I, I'm in tears. Because I know they're solid. Month later, the war comes. The Christians are forced to scatter. And some scatter to Lviv, some scatter to Warsaw, some to other churches like Amsterdam and London. But you know, here it is, a year later, and if you look on your sheet, we started 2022 with hopefully 17 church plantings. But in the year of spirit, we've done 28. Why? Because two of the plantings, number 10, Lviv, and number 18, Warsaw, came from this war and disciples being scattered and preaching the word. Not only that, but the Russians just last week started to have um, a draft, conscription. And so some of the brothers had to leave Moscow. And they have gone to Tbilisi, and now we have another church in Tbilisi, Georgia. See, we got to believe in the sovereignty of God. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying everything that happens is good. Absolutely not. War is evil. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah. But God takes the satanic, and he turns it. Yeah. And he makes it for his glory. And now we have three more churches that were not planned. Because disciples were hard lying. Wow. Now here it is a year later. Of the 72 when I left, we know where all but one is. We only have had one fall away. Wow. Why? Because there was a call for a sold out base. Not just by the evangelists, but by the Bible talk leaders. Wow. The place where most churches lose their sold out base is at the Bible talk level. The Bible talk leaders are not taking the authority that God has given them to call these people to be sold out for Jesus Christ. To get up early in the morning and to preach the word day after day. Are you with me here? You see, the Spirit can move aside the mountains of growth and the mountains of retention. The last point is simply place down the capstone. You remember that was the vision that Zechariah had is that Zubarul would take that capstone and he would place it on the temple. In other words, the temple was going to be completed. Well, very interestingly, we have in our movement what's called the Crown of Thorns Project. Turn to the last page. And we call it our plan, but actually it's Jesus' plan. <laughs> it's taken from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It's actually on the piece of paper itself. Jesus says to the apostles, But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So our Jerusalem is Los Angeles. It was planted May 6, 2007. Judea and Samaria, well, that's the United States and Canada. If you look at the page before it, you'll now see 
that in America, in the United States, we are in 37 of the 50 states of America. And by 2024, all of America will be green. All 50 states will have discipling churches. Is that exciting? You say, well, wow, we have 49 American churches and we have 149 churches all together. Why? Why so many in America? Are Americans more important to save? Absolutely not. But the Americans give the mission money that helps out all of the world's sectors, including also China. This year alone, they will have given over $6 million for missions. Well, notice, that's only step two. Then step three is to the ends of the earth. Well, the ends of the earth are still the ends of the earth. This plan was put upon my heart in 2009. So the first phase is to plant the Crown Thorns Church as well. The first Crown Thorns Church was Santiago. That was the only one that was green on this whole 12 church page. Now, notice uh, number six right there, Sydney, 2014. Amen, guys? But believe it or not, this got done in eight years. By 2017, we had done this whole thing. And so then we turn our attention, that's where we are right now, phase two is to target the surrounding nations. Yes. Is to get to all the nations that have a city of at least a million in population. You know, uh, it is to be said that the easy part of world evangelism has been done. Yeah. Now we get to the tough, tough places. Yeah. You know, the world sector leaders, including Joan Kerry, and the Antalans, we have set a date of December 23rd to get to every single one of these nations in phase two. Wow. Is that exciting right there? Wow. Right now, we're in 56 nations and counting. Um, you know, the question might come to you, well, what's going to be the last nation? Afghanistan? Uh, North Korea? Uh, Cuba? Oh no, we did Cuba last month. That's right. And, you know, we, we don't know. Um, I know for sure that you guys, over the next few years, you're, you're going to do Fiji. You're going to do Port Moresby there in Papua New Guinea. You're going to do Singapore real soon, I pray. But for you, I, I think it's a little bit different charge given the 1.4 billion people of China. Yeah. It was very interesting talking to James about the different key cities in China. Yeah. Of course, in, in the south, you got Guangzhou. It's about 20 million. Yeah. Then kind of the west central, you've got Chongqing. It's about 25 million. Okay. Then you got, in the east, you got Shanghai. And then according to James, the biggest city of all is Beijing. Wow. And approaching almost 30 million. Wow. Can you picture in 2030, December, the mission team Come on. To Beijing. Come on. Can you picture your world sector leader? Joe? <laughs> lifting, lifting up on, Joe. that capstone. All right. Titled Beijing. Wow. Lifting it on up in front of the angels, in front of the Lord, in front of all of the world sector, and placing this beautiful stone on top of the completed temple. Can you see that? Well, here's a simple challenge from tonight. Number one, wake up. Take the up. Number two, the spirit moves aside mountains. Take the side. And number three, place down the capstone. Upside down. That's how we're going to turn this world. Are you with me right here? If you are asked to move to another church, discuss it. 
If you're asked to be on a mission team, like Sean and Eric Benzuela, just say, God bless it. If you are asked as a national to go home, particularly to China, like Chi, just simply say, God bless it. If you're asked to go in the full-time ministry, like James Kwok and Lon, who had to leave being a doctor in the law, just simply say, God bless it. Can you, can you just imagine what the Lord is doing? Yeah. 2007, there were just 42 disciples that started the City of Angels LA Church. And now there are over 10,000 disciples around the world. In 149 churches, in 56 nations, on all six populated continents of the world. Mark my words. This is not the movement of men. It is the very movement of God. And may God bless it.